Despite the deceleration of inflation in December 2022, the Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank of Nigeria has increased the benchmark interest rate by 100 basis points to 17.5%, uh, leaving all parameters are uh, on change. This will be the fifth time uh, that uh, the CBN will increase interest rates, despite advice from manufacturers and some key stakeholders. Briefing journalists earlier today, the just concluded meeting, the first meeting for the year 2023, the CBN governor, uh, Mr. Mefili, noted that the previous increases are beginning to yield the results with a, with a slight drop in inflation rates recorded in December 2022, stressing that need to keep tightening its fiscal policy. The Apex Bank had increased the NPR from 11.5% early last year to 16.5% for consecutive hikes in 2022, a development that has led to maximum lending rates in the country rising to 29.13% in December, from 28.14% held in November. To give more analysis on these deliberations made in the January MPC meeting, I'm being joined via Zoom by two experts. Uh, um, first, I'm being joined by the Managing Director, Chief Executive Officer at Dignity Finance and Investment Limited, Dr. Chijoke Ekechuku, who joins us from Abuja, and also from Lagos. I'm being joined by the Managing Director, Chief Business Officer at Optimus Biafra Invest, Mr. Ayodeji Ebo, live from Lagos. Good afternoon, our gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Good afternoon, Tolu. Yeah, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Let me start from Abuja. Uh, Dr. Ekechuku, we saw a decline in inflation for the month of December, and we all thought that something was going to happen, either retaining or just maintaining status quo. That was what we thought was going to happen at the end of the meeting today. But surprisingly, the CBN governor has decided to add 100 basis points to increase the NPR, how does this come to you? How would you react to this development? Um, <laughs> it was also a surprise to a lot of uh, economists and analysts. A lot of people, a lot of pundits would have um, argued that the rates would have been retained, um, knowing that uh, only a few weeks ago, these rates uh, rose to 16.5. And so, and um, the decline, the marginal decline in um, the inflation rate also informed the fact that um, NPR would have been retained. Um, but I know what may have informed what decision taken by CBN uh, would be what is going on in the global market, the economic market, financial market. You just observe that uh, European central banks uh, have actually continued to increase their, MP uh, their monetary policy rates even when inflation rate looks like uh, um, they're dropping gradually. So um, maybe, uh, to, to say the least, if this is working for them, uh, let us also see why they took that decision and things like that. But suffice it to say, I don't want to believe it was just because um, it worked in reducing the, the inflation rate. Um, that's why the, the, the uh, NPR was uh, increased. Because we also need to look at the impact of increasing NPR. Right now, um, all of us know that as we speak right now, and all the banks looking at the, 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 the new NPR will start adjusting their interest rates. And if that happens, new credit facilities are going to be coming up with this interest, they with higher interest rates. And um, this is obviously not good for business in Nigeria. It's not good for business, for manufacturers and all that business concerns to start assessing loans at very, very high rates. Um, we also know that this is going to reduce borrowing. Um, if it's going to reduce borrowing, it's also going to affect the uh, stimulation of, uh, of the economy. And that is just what we don't want to happen. And of course, in the other way, you see that this is also going to affect prices of goods. Uh, if there are manufacturing companies that are producing things and services, you see that um, rates are going to change, and if rates have changed, then that means they, 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 will, they will impact the prices of goods they are offering to the market. Um, but of course, on the flip side, we know that um, um, investments 
uh, money market is going to start uh, booming because a lot of people are going to move their money from some other markets and come to money, money market because it is just going to be attractive right now. And uh, if it is attractive, you see that uh, monies that have been in other sectors like property, like capital market, will start leaving gradually and start coming to money market. And so this is what we see that may happen right now. We also know that uh, with this, um, foreign direct investment may start picking up. People are going to collapse their investment in some other countries and start coming in into the country because they're going to get a good return for their investment. You know, so some of this, but we just know that, um, um, and uh, you know, <laughs> I usually use this word, say you cannot uh, be appropriating and reprobating. You want to build manufacturing sector and you're also using your monetary policy to kill the same manufacturing sector you want to build. So these are some of the things that are going to come um, as we continue with this new interest rate regime. Mm. <clears throat> A great way to start uh, this discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kechuku. Now, let me ask Mr. Ebo, uh, what were you expecting uh, at this first meeting uh, for, for the year, Mr. Ayodiji Ebo, before we go into some more details of what this really means? Because as of today, the maximum lending rate is about 29.13%. And the CBN governor is placing the NPR at 17.5% as we speak. Okay, thanks. Uh, it also came to me as a surprise uh, because uh, if we would also look at the impact of the increase that we've seen, increases rather, that we've seen in the past uh, MPC meeting, how has it translated into increased yield in the fixed income market? It's not because there are other factors that determine yields in the fixed income market, which is also the, the demand from the demand side and liquidity in the system. So you look at the average yield of bonds, it's still around 14%. Uh, if you look at what the yields were even before the increase started uh, last year, treasury bills is less than 6% or even not 5% now. So this increase in rates is not translated into improved fixed income yields because that is how it will reduce impact inflation, uh, impact on inflation, because when people see that Yields in the fixed income market is more attractive rather than spend, it would save. But what we are, what is happening now is there's that direct transmission into lending rates. I'm happy you said um, when you mentioned it, it's already at 29%. So for most lending rates, it's done at floating rates in Nigeria. So it's like NPR plus something. And because also the um, this rate, NPR, also impacts on this, the asymmetric corridor, which will impact on how much they borrow, uh, bank borrow from, uh, lend from the, or borrow a deposit from the CBN. So it impacts directly on their cost of funds, which would also impact on cost of savings. You know that savings rate is at uh, 25% of NPR. So those who, in, in that angle, it's impacting on lending rate, while from the investor's angle, it's not impacting on interest rates. So at the end of the day, you also want to now be concerned that uh, what would what is the CBN or the MPC trying to achieve? Because when lending rate is going up, it's really going to impact on businesses. Cost of finance will go up. However, the spending that we are seeing will not stop because People will prefer to buy now. One inflation rate is at 21.34%, and treasury bills is at 5.6%. I'll prefer to buy what I want to buy now rather than save the money because it will not make any sense to save at 6% and have inflation at 21%. So there are a lot of other factors. Uh, the inflation rate that we saw that moderated, when you check it on a month on month basis, it still it went up. So it's not like inflation is moderating. And it's also not that we're also seeing that impact of the monetary policy raise on inflation. What we are seeing is uh, the increases we are seeing is due to other factors, like food inflation, Zaya, 23%. So those are other factors. And that is why it also came to me as a surprise, because I thought that the CBN would give some time to see that transmission impact of the previous increases. Uh, 
we we're all also talking about the ways and means that has also in part that's increasing money supply. So there are still a, a lot of factors, even if we raise the interest rate to 20%, what would be the impact? With, are we going to see transmission that impact on the yields? The expected increase in yields is being traced to the ability or the, 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 um, the gap in the budget that the, CBA, uh, that the government will be borrowing more, not necessarily as a result of uh, the NPR. So signaling is good uh, for the hawkish stance, but its impact that it would have on the entire economy, the SMEs, the impact it will have on cost of borrowing is really going to um, bring forth more negative impact than positive. Hmm. Interesting stuff. Uh, Dr. Kechuku, just yesterday, the FRS uh, said that um, they made 10.1 trillion naira uh, that's for the year 2022. Non oil taxes, revenues, and all of that. Uh, that figure looks very good. And it takes me to my very question. Our non oil space is where I think we need to focus on at the moment. But uh, 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 we're getting these figures from there. But are we trying to uh, create enablers that will, uh, of course, encourage and you know, strengthen this sector to be able to support government? revenue. We've seen what is happening gradually with oil. It's not looking as bright as it used to look. Yes, um, <clears throat> that's why I said uh, um, every time any government official comes to the TV, they're talking about diversification of the economy. And when you talk about diversification, you talk about many other sectors different from the oil sector. And imagine that that um, we have in a particular place 20 factories that are more important today, 20 factories that used to exist, that used to pay taxes, that used to pay other fees to government, and 20 factories that used to um, employ such number of people and not being in business today, government would have lost all the taxes accruable to government and for the development of the economy. And so um, as government is losing that, our G GDP figures are just remaining as low as it could be when it can actually be higher. Every time we hear about uh, the problem of the country is revenue, um, revenue, lack of net revenue or little revenue. Meanwhile, all the things that will actually grow the revenue of the country have been hindered and been uh, threatened. Um, this particular policy is actually going to threaten manufacturing and uh, I don't think we want to continue to see manufacturing sector go down all the time and uh, uh, purchasing managers index uh, looking low all the time um, compared to other countries. So we need to um, be seen to be serious with certain policies. If, certain, if, a, poli if a policy is of a fiscal area um, affecting the monetary policy and vice versa, we need to see that. That's why I see, there needs, as I've said before, there, there has to be enough synergy between the monetary policy and the fiscal policy because many times they work against themselves. And uh, of course, we saw a situation where one policy area said we are not aware of the need for redesign of the Naira and vice versa. And so these are the kind of synergies we are, we are lacking in the system. I want to believe that if we have that synergy, most of these decisions will be uh, towards uh, geared gear towards uh, enhancing the economy and uh, so that we have good results for them. For now, um, it looks like one works against another as if uh, we're in two different countries. Hmm. Well, a good one. Let me, let me now ask uh, Mr. Ayode Jebo. Uh, Mr. Ayode, the, the very big topic, a big issue, and uh, we've been on this for some time. I uh, will keep, we'll stay on it, of course, to the 31st of January, and that gives you the hint of what I'm talking about. It's the new Naira notes. And the CBN government, has said that he's going to disappoint all of those that were thinking that he's going to extend that date, saying that January 31st is still the way to go, that he's, there is no going back. Though we've had the Senate saying that you have to extend this by another six months uh, before implementation. We don't know how all of that will play out. It's been summoned again. But what is your reaction uh, to this, uh, Mr. Ayode Jebo? How available, how much of these new notes do you have and uh, those around you? Okay, yeah. 
So, yeah, thankfully, I, I listened to the CBN governor, and uh, I feel that maybe he's not getting the right report of what the actual situation of things, uh, because when you go to most ATM, as at today, today is 24th, uh, which will have seven days to go. It's still the old notes that you would find. So um, I think that there's still, a, there's still a lot that still needs to be done in terms of the logistics of the distribution. By now, we should not even be finding old notes in ATM machines because it's like you are still, you are trying to take something out or you are still releasing more uh, into the, into the circulation. So um, I, it's, it's really going to increase the, uh, the time that it will be required to be phased out. So uh, my own reaction would be that uh, maybe the, the updates uh, the CBI governor has, uh, is, is not showing the true picture of what actually is happening when we look at it based on the reality on ground. And there may be need um, maybe by time is updated of the current uh, situation, there may be need to see whether how to either fast track the situation of things and or, or also extend um, the period so that we have uh, more of this news and uh, note circulation. Uh, uh, Dr. Ekechuku, I, I, I'm going to ask you the same question. Uh, what is your reaction to that? CBN governor says no going back. January 31st, we're staying with this date. How feasible is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know that you are in Lagos and uh, I am in Abuja. I'm so sure you have the, the notes. Major city, you, you, you have enough yeah, of the notes in Abuja. I, I, I have some, I can tell you. I have some. But <laughs> um, even if I have some, you know that many people have not even touched one before. Hmm. And so if people who are in Lagos and Abuja have not touched these currencies, um, imagine people who are in rural areas, who are in various local government areas, in very rural areas. Um, some of them may not even have seen the picture of what it looks like. Somewhere, as at last week, some rural women uh, rejected uh, the new note that was given to them after people bought things from them. And so that will just tell you the fact that um, um, the last time we talked about the need for um, reorienting people and letting people know about the new currency, but Right now, what we're dealing with is the availability. It is not available and not available enough to go around this country. So um, this, is, this just gives uh, CBN the kind of feedback to know what action they're going to take between now and uh, the end of the, the month. It's not about, uh, it's not, uh, about uh, a show of uh, power. It's about what is possible and what is uh, real in the system. Um, whether there are people who are saying you must increase, you must extend, and he is saying we are not going to extend, it's a different thing altogether. But let us face the realities: these things are not available even in uh, um, cities. Then you can imagine how unavailable they are in rural areas. And uh, so these are realities on ground. Hmm. Interesting one. Well, let me take it back to Mr. Yodeji Ebo. Uh, Mr. Ebo, I'd like us to talk about the exchange rate issue, uh, which is top in all of this. And um, uh, some analysts have said we have some kind of policy-inflicted problems uh, along that line, that there are some things we could do that could ease up that space. While many would also argue that Nigeria is not really a productive economy, that we do a lot of export, uh, so we can't get all of the FX that we need uh, at the same time. But what do you think about the impact of this on our entire ecosystem as we continue to grapple with it year in, year out? Okay, thanks. And for me, the way I would first look at this is if we don't know the root cause, uh, we can't also be preparing a solution. The first thing that we need to note is that one of the major sources of FX to the CBN dr has dried up, which is oil proceeds. So it is uh, beyond the euro bond and multilateral loans that uh, the CBN got uh, funding in the last two years, uh, at least also 
uh, based on statement from the is this CBN <laughs> governor last year that they had not received any proceed oil proceeds from the NMPC for almost six or seven or almost eight months. That is a major impact which will lead to rationing. And as a result of that, uh, the CBN has rationed and has indirectly pushed the demand to the parallel market because when you don't get in the official market, even if you're a blue chip company and you require dollars, but you, you have access, uh, you're on the eligible list, but you don't have it. Because when you uh, for them, the cost of shutting down is more than the cost of keep you produce. They can't be out of stock. So most of them use what we call blended rates. So you get your 10, 20% based on allocation from the CBN. And the remaining 80% will be sourced from the parallel markets or the unofficial markets. And as a result, we can see that impact on prices because if they have the official market at around 4.35 Naira to a dollar and the unofficial market at around 4.50 Naira to a dollar. So you can see, also see the spread. So there's a need to, one, increase that supply. So they need to reduce the amount of um, oil theft such that there's an increase in the flow back to the CBN. Uh, secondly, there's also a need to increase supply. So when you look at our reserves at um, above $38 billion, yes, when you look at the uh, the liquid parts, uh, there's also the swap parts um, within the reserves. There's a need to increase supply and also provide confidence. Uh, so beyond increasing supply, it's also good to know that there must also be an adjustment at the official market to reduce the, the potential the, the demand. So if there's an adjustment <laughs> at the official market, then you increase supply. Then we begin to see that gap close. So as long as this gap remains, there would be incentive for people to ignore the official market. Remittances is supposed to have increased in Nigeria, given a lot of the uh, migration that we've seen in the past two years, uh, because mo most people still have people home and they send money home. But most of those remittances are not coming through the official channel, which is also starving the CBN. So there's a need to look at how we want to overhaul that. I know there's the 65 Naira to every, uh, the dollar for the uh, exporters. There's also the 5 Naira for those that are remitting. But with a spread of close to 300 Naira, there's no incentive, um, no amount of money that the CBN wants to give that will compensate for that spread. I can bring in my dollars at um, and collect it at, if I had the 65 Naira at 500 Naira, while I can see a market that I can easily sell where there's demand at 750 Naira. So that needs to be taken care of before we can make good progress regarding FX management. Thank you so much. Brilliant stuff, uh, Mr. Aide uh, Dr. Kechuku, I know you have something to say regarding Forex because uh, at the moment, manufacturers are scrambling for it. They can't get uh, the official rates. And this continues to affect, uh, of course, it into uh, the external reserves and all that the CBN has to offer. So what do you also think is a way out of this? Uh, do you think it's a demand and supply thing? Yeah, first of all, it's obviously a demand and supply thing at all times. Um, my, my concern is the fact that the problem of uh, exchange rates didn't just happen today, didn't happen yesterday, didn't happen last month or last year. Um, beyond um, the supply or beyond the intervention from our foreign reserve, and then, of course, beyond these kind of incentives that we have seen, I haven't seen so much effort made that can actually increase the supply in the market. Uh, recall that <clears throat> in the 70s and 80s, we used to have a uh, Nigerian national shipping line um, that were generators of uh, foreign currency. And of course, all those things were coming into government. We used to have many of the assembly plants in Nigeria 
um, having to assemble, and we are not demanding, obviously, all this, we're not importing the knockdown parts from abroad. And so most of the things that we used to do within our country um, at that time have actually been a source to foreign countries, and we have to continue to need foreign currency for them. So the demand has actually outpaced the supply for a long time. And until we are able to take government policies that will increase supply within the country, uh, we're going to continue to struggle with all this. You know, so if we try to, just like uh, Ayodeji said, if we try to narrow the gap between the official rate and the foreign market rate, obviously that will help. So that even when people uh, export goods, they want to pass through the government process and get the same value they would have gotten from um, uh, this, the side market. You know, so we, again, our exports, um, this time we talk about the need to encourage exports and the exports and increase exports. When we continue to increase exports and, and the incentives for exports, and we are not encouraging the people to have value for their money and the real value of foreign exchange, um, we may not get the, the benefits of even increasing the exports. So having said all this, um, I also agree that the last time the, 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 the incentive rate reduced was just because there was an intervention from Eurobond and that money came in. And then of course, I, I told a good number of people then that they will see that this rate is going to be stabilized a little because of this law. But um, right now, there has to be very serious policy decisions that will uh, increase our revenue base in foreign currency and actually um, reduce our imports. Um, are there those policy statements that can actually make people to have backward integration instead of all these things, all the raw materials were imported? Are there options within the country that can actually reduce the importation we're doing? These are some of the decisions I expect that will happen in order for us to reduce our dependence on imports and see what can happen, what we can source within that can reduce our importation. Um, if we do this, uh, maybe um, the pressure will reduce. The pressure will reduce. Um, of course, he also talked about the, the oil theft that has uh, reduced uh, our revenue base from that area. Recall that we, uh, we used to have um, a capacity. We used to have a capacity, a production capacity of oil up to 2.2 million barrels a day. Today, you and I know where we are. We're still hovering around 1.2. Sometimes we'll hear that we have increased to 1.4 million barrels a day. Um, we, those are not going to give us the kind of uh, revenue that will uh, take us to where we want to be in terms of revenue. So those are some of the, most of the problems that are affecting us, and uh, we need to identify them one after the other and start solving them in order for us to stabilize the foreign currency rates. Now, now this this conversation is getting more interesting uh, now, and I uh, I I like to talk to uh, Mr. Ebo. Mr. Eddie Ebo, are you still there? Yes. Great. Uh, let's look at debt issues here now. Uh, looking at our current state of debt. And considering the inputs and all the reactions to the ways and means from the CBN, uh, many are talking around this. And I really like to get your views. What is your position? The central bank governor said one way or the other, they must come in to help the federal government when it's needed. But what is your reaction to the debt level and issues around the ways and means? Okay, thanks. Um, my main concern is the repayment. How are we going to be able to pay this back? And because if mostly the debt is currently being used mostly for, or uh, is being channeled mostly into non productive areas. So when you look at debt servicing a loan, it means you are using debt to service debt. If by time you don't get revenue, it's about 6.3 trillion. And that would also now increase. And uh, if there's a devaluation of the Naira, as well as the borrowings that will be done this year, which is about uh, 11, 12 trillion, though we are projecting about 15 trillion by the time you had square subsidies. And look at the last year's performance. So 
that will increase the service, uh, the debt servicing again, which means that the way we are going, our actual revenue may not be able to cover only debt service again, which in, in plain language, which means that we may have to borrow to even service the debt, which is a critical situation. And because these funds are uh, based on the uh, data, let's say it's about 80%. There was a, one of the quarters last year that I entered almost 100%. So let's say average about 80%. It means that to even look at the productive areas that will generate the money, there may be, there's no funds to, to channel into that space. Or you, you have to borrow, uh, borrow more to channel into that space. So I think it's worrisome. Yes, when you look at the data, when you look at debt uh, to GDP, uh, it looks so small uh, at uh, maybe 3.5%. But when you also want to look at the debt to revenue, so it means that our GDP, which is the productive area, we are not extracting value. We are not adding value. Manufacturing is not working. And we also see like Doctor has said, some of the policies that is impacting on the manufacturing. So if we are not able to grow most of these productive sectors, that would even generate the revenue that gives you the gives the company uh, the ability to be profitable. It is when they are profitable that they can pay tax. It is when there's the turnover that they can pay VAT on their businesses. So if they are not growing, even the government will not also be able to increase. It's a um, non-oil revenue, which would impact significantly on the pro projections. So there's in terms of the sustainability, I would say that it's really becoming scary when you look at the ability of the government to even pay back. And you spoke about the ways and means, which it's around 22 trillion. Yes, they're trying to securitize that. But you also look at which market, so if it's securitized, you look at the PFA, uh, the asset of the PFAs is still under, I can't recall the figure, it's still under 20 trillion. So where at which market will be able to absorb that? And it's a long-term fund. The banks don't invest significantly in long-term funds that would say they have the deposits to do that. So it's really called that there's a lot of questions than answers. And I would say that there's a need uh, to begin to, if we're also going to borrow, to begin to channel the effort. One quick win for any, the, any of the president, new president that would emerge is that there needs to be a deliberate phase out of the first subsidy to be able to create some allowance. About 3.6 trillion have been created for first half alone, which is almost 80% of capital expenditure of about 4.8 trillion. So if we are able to start saving, let's say we start for the year, if we don't remove first subsidy and for the year, that's about 7.2 trillion. If we begin to say this year, the savings that would, would reduce subsidy gradually and save 2 trillion, but this 2 trillion, like the way government ring fence funding from Sukuk bond, we we'll ring fence this fund and be able to show people projects that would put the funds. Over time, if it's in the next two or three years, and you're able to save seven trillion and we can see the projects, then Nigerians will have the confidence because these are the things that will boost manufacturing. These are the things that would improve ease of doing business. And as a result, the multiplier effect is more. The non-oil revenue that government will be able to make when businesses boom will be more than what we are losing directly as a result of our inability to create enabling environment. Hmm. A good one. Now, let's wrap up now. And I'll start again with Dr. Ekechuku. What are these bold policy actions or bold policy steps that we need to take maybe ahead of the next MPC meeting? <laughs> um, it's just going to be all encompassing. Um, if we take uh, very major steps, 
uh, you know, we, we need to deal with a good number of issues that are actually affecting a lot of things. Um, you know, recall that nobody talks about the impact of uh, uh, lack of power in the manufacturing sector. Nobody talks about it because it, it looks like uh, we've been repeating the same story all the time. So um, have we said that power has become impossible for Nigeria to attain? Um, knowing that many African countries that are far, far smaller than Nigeria have achieved um, power independence and Nigeria continues to struggle with this for such a long time. So let us put power aside. And what is that thing that power is gonna do is the fact that uh, manufacturing sector will automatically get into boom once power sector starts working and working well. You know, so if we are able to make sure manufacturing sector starts working, there'll be a lot of revenue that will be generated. Um, a lot of uh, uh, manufacturers will just reach their optimum and produce for the local market and for the outside market and start exporting. When they export, a lot of things are going to be brought back into this, into this country. In fact, a lot of foreign currency will come into the country and will continue to have this revenue base. You know, so if we're able to deal with that and deal with uh, the aspect of making sure manufacturing sector works and look at all the moribund sectors that we used to have that were generating income for us. Let's also look at all of them and look at how to start resuscitating them. Um, only yesterday, the Chinese company that was in charge of uh, the project of the deep, deep, deep uh, uh, sea um, said that this is just an investment that is not like a credit facility. And so they are looking at more and more of such projects that can happen, such investments that can happen in Nigeria. So if this is going to bring us a lot of revenue, both in foreign, local currency and foreign currency, how can we replicate this kind of investment in Nigeria to the extent that we can start having all this income uh, coming from the, uh, the tax area, the VAT area, and in fact, coming from all the duties that we paid for. From. So there are many of such opportunities that can actually happen in the country where we're going to start being very productive um, in all sectors. So if we do this, we are already doing reasonably enough um, in the areas of agriculture. But of course, agriculture without good security, again, cannot be optimized. And we need to take care of security and make sure that investors are not afraid to come into Nigeria. And um, um, there are a lot to be said. If I continue, Deji you won't have anything to say before we close. So let me just allow him <laughs> to say something. Uh, all right, let's, let's allow I'm Mr. Ayo De Jebo also give us his part in short. Mr. Ayo, uh, what are you saying with regards to bold steps? Let's just wrap up on that note. I, I would say it's uh, one of its insecurity, which is going to cut across. Insecurity would bring direct investment. Insecurity would help produce more food that will impact on food inflation. So there's a need to craft a deliberate strategy to reduce <clears throat> incidence of insecurity in the country. So it's going to be like a quick win, such that even tourism would, would, uh, would, would boom. And as a result of that, when you have more productivity, more jobs, and indirectly it will now reduce insecurity. Thank you. Hmm. Well, it's a good way to live it. Interesting conversation, I must say, there we've been having uh, for more than uh, 30, 40 minutes. I've been speaking to Mr. Ayodeji Ebo. He is the Chief Business Officer and Managing Director at uh, Optimus by Afri Invest. I've also been speaking from Abuja. He's Dr. Chijoke Ekechuku. He's the Managing Director, Chief Executive Officer at Dignity Finance and Investment Limited. Also a top member at uh, the Abuja Chamber of Commerce uh, and Industry. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for making us uh, make sense of the outcome of the January MPC meeting. Thank you. Do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, Tolu.